Welcome to The Standard from Vancouver, I'm Peter Klein. Tonight, did Jesus really say all the things the Bible says he did? Greenpeace co-founder turned biblical scholar Rex Weiler will be here to talk about what he's uncovered about one of the most famous men in human history. But first, one of the CIA's former top spies is here to talk, at, uh, talk about Afghanistan, Iraq, Iran, and what the world might look like without Islam. Earlier this week, the website WikiLeaks posted more than 90,000 classified documents detailing the U.S. war effort in Afghanistan. It's been called the Pentagon Papers of Our Times, a treasure trove of classified details about how the war against the Taliban is being fought. To help us understand what the leaked documents mean for the war effort, we've invited the CIA's former Kabul station chief to join us. Graham Fuller spent 25 years with the Central Intelligence Agency. He's also the author, author of several books, including his new one, A World Without Is Islam, due out later this summer. Welcome, Graham. Thank you, Peter. Put a, first, just give us the background. What, what do these documents say? I mean, obviously, you haven't looked through all of them, but what's the gist of what, what's come out? Well, I think there are a broad range of documents, but basically they talk about uh, specific operations much more than they do about broad policy. So what you get is thousands and thousands of smaller details. Um, What's that, the takeaway from it, though? Well, to me, the takeaway is simply that I think the war looks a whole lot messier and much less certain than the spin that Washington would like to put on it. And indeed, I mean, to me, if we're going to talk about the value or the risk of these leaks, I think in a time when governments are ever more successful at putting the spin that they want mm -hmm. on policies, um, this is an important antidote. Does it surprise you that the war is apparently going worse than it's been? I mean, you worked in, in that world for, for a long time. Isn't yeah, that what I, government does? Uh, yeah, I think it does. I don't think there are any real surprises, though, to people who follow the war very closely. It's more or less what people expected or anticipated, uh, but in the end, it lends substance and, and concrete detail to those arguments. Well, one, one of the, there's lots of things that have come out, and obviously I haven't been through all of it, but one of the things that, that, that's detailed in there that sort of struck me as odd that, hasn't, that it hasn't been disclosed is that Taliban has been using portable heat-seeking missiles, the kind that Mujahideen had, had used back when, when you were um, in, in Kabul, so what, against U.S. and, and other NATO um, aircraft. Why is that something that, the, that NATO and the U.S. would not have wanted revealed? I mean, what's the secret about that? Well, I mean, first of all, I, well, I was surprised by it because I had not heard, right. this, heard is, this, this before. Surprising it was, disclosure. I think, to most people. But um, I think it may be a very dismaying factor so that if people hear that, oh, my God, they can begin start taking down our helicopters mm -hmm. at will, which is what happened well, when, with the jihad against the Soviet Union right. presence in Afghanistan when the U.S. began to deliver Stinger missiles and other such things. So it can be devastating. Mm -hmm. And I think the, 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 the fear, the pucker factor, if you will, of what this can mean for the future of the war is, uh, is very disturbing. Right. Well, one of the other disclosures in these documents is that, I guess, some evidence that Pakistan has been helping the Taliban. I mean, this is something that, that has been suspected. A lot of people have been talking about it. I guess here's some documentary evidence of that. Um, what's, I mean, what's your take on that? Yeah, I mean, I found nothing surprising in this mm -hmm. at all, um, because it, it's been very clear to anybody who's seriously following the situation that Pakistan's interests uh, diverged to a considerable degree from those of the United States. So this may be more useful ammunition to have specific public evidence with which to beat Pakistan. But the basic fact is that Pakistan is being destabilized by the American war in Afghanistan. And the more the pr pressure the United States puts on Pakistan to save the Afghan war, the more dangerous and, and, and uh, risky the situation becomes inside Pakistan. So at this point, Pakistan is deeply concerned that it's been pushed over the brink, if you will, of confrontation with many of its own religious elements that had not been a problem prior to the Afghan war. Right. Well, you, you have argued that if, if, if the U.S. and, and its NATO allies had not gone into Afghanistan. Afghanistan probably would have expelled al-Qaeda 
on its own, or at least under pressure from its neighbors, correct? I think you can make a pretty good case. Nobody can be sure about it, but uh, I think if under, with time, it could have happened. But that wasn't what the President Bush wanted. He right. wanted a war. But if you were back at the CIA at, at, during that time, would you have recommended um, any sort of military action in Afghanistan? I certainly, given the magnitude of the attack, I think it would be hard to, to put that off indefinitely. But I think you could, have, you could have made a very good case that it was worth waiting, further negotiation, getting together Muslim, uh, other Muslim countries that were very much on the same, wa same wavelength as we were to get the Taliban to expel bin Laden. They had no, they did not have that much of a stake in bin Laden's presence there. So, yeah, I think it was an opportunity missed, but you can argue from a politician's point of view in Washington, you couldn't wait, they had to do it. That can be debated forever. All right. There seems to be this narrative that, that we've seen since 9-11, and frankly, we've seen in all sorts of periods, periods of, of, of recent history, at least, and Adam, this, I suspect this goes back way back, but where there are, you know, I don't mean to flatter you, but a handful of really smart people, insiders, either within the the government, like you were at one point, or even outside of the government, as you are now, who raise certain issues, then the majority of the, mm -hmm. the, the, you know, the government says, now let's go this way, and then afterwards, like, oh, shoot, we should have, we should have. I mean, you look at Iraq. Um, I mean, I remember you and I first spoke shortly after the invasion of Iraq, uh, when I was going over to interview Muqtad al-Sada for 60 Minutes, and no one knew who he was, no one really understood the Shiites. You had just written a book, The Shiites of, of Iraq, and you would warn that, look, the Shiites are not going to welcome us with open arms, the flowers, the way that most people in the Bush administration are saying. And the Bush folks were saying, look, the Shiites are, we're the enemy of Saddam, and the enemy of our enemy is our friend, right? Why is there such a disconnect between the people in the know and the people who are in power? That's a great question, and it's probably behind all foreign policy crises in the history of the world in many senses. Politicians uh, by definition, have to be responsive to what they think their political agenda is. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, this is the coming of age for almost every single intelligence officer right. when he gets into the field, is discovering that you may have great information and great analysis and send it back to Washington, and you think, therefore, that take everything else is taken care right. of, to only to discover that really it's domestic politics that is the main driver, and at times, you know, intelligence can help and form slightly. At other times, good intelligence is positively inconvenient right. to the policies of governments and they don't want to hear it because they've already set the course and to suggest that it's not going the way they want is not helpful at all. Is, is a fr that frustration, and I've heard that frustration from a number of folks in, in, the, in the intelligence sectors, is that one of the things that led you to eventually leave? No, I left after 25 years. Uh, I'd been there a long time. I found it an extraordinary and fascinating job. I learned a great deal from it. Um, but I began to see there was a bigger world out there of people who had no clearances whatsoever, whatsoever no, no access to classified information, who were getting it right. Uh, and I thought that it would be very interesting. And furthermore, not only getting it right, but sometimes having a greater voice than writing the within the right. obscure, by speaking in public, than writing within the obscurity of classified documents within government. Well, there's an interesting story that you t you've told in the past about writing an obscure classified document, which you then change your mind about, but somehow it, it actually kind of the train left and, and helped lead to the Iran-Contra affair, which we'll talk about in a lot more with Graham Fuller after this short break.